from Chicago. Not yet. Not, oh, God damn it, you said we're live. <laughs> from Chicago, this is Around Comics, the comic culture podcast where we talk about everything in and around the world of comics and comics culture. I'm Chris Trenisman, and I am joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Mr. Brian Salazar. I'm Slade Wilson today. That's an. It's, I'll, I'll, I can explain the joke, but don't. It's not. Yeah, there. please, please don't. It's. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's back. Huh? He's looking a little feral. Yeah. There's no flood or riots or. <laughs> that's that, that I know that I know of. I mean, you know, 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 months, murder months. hornets. Yeah. Who knows? Sun. It's been a wild. It's been a wild set of Sundays. <laughs> are, the, are, are, the river, are the rivers filled with blood? Yeah. Well, no. Now they're they're just filled to the top with water. Yeah. Okay. The, binny, the binnies got burned down, guys. Oh. <laughs> whoa. That's that's oh, that was the rumor. Yeah. Well, Tom, it's great to have you back, and uh, uh, and you're you. you're the uh, you're the star of tonight's uh, episode. The, the oh. Oh, stressful. The spotlight shines directly on you, sir, as you are going to uh, to walk us through the uh, the the uh, wonderful era of Steve Englehart JLA. Yeah, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of info in 15 minutes. Nice. Right. But... <laughs> We're gonna get um, educated. Well, you're gonna get educated. I did. Uh, I did create a a, a stinger. For for this, if we want, we got. It's time for comics one hundred and one. It's entertainment. Oh wow, that <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's... I've been busy in quarantine, yeah. Tom. S- <laughs> sitting stingers for everything. It's just a show of just various graphics. Just got like... tons of it. Tons of graphics. Don't mention Kickstarter, Tom. No, <laughs> do <not. laughs> Okay, I won't. You know how badly I want to. <laughs> All right. Um, so before we get started here, I know that uh, I know that Sal has all sorts of, of ways to connect uh, to the show and and different stuff. Let's let's get that knocked out uh, right off the the bat here. And well, as you can see by our little scrolling thingy down there, now you can uh, contact us. Yeah, you like that? You, know, you can subscribe, comment below. Uh, we are now on uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and Periscope, so you can watch us on any of those uh, formats now. Uh, you can contact <laughs> us at info at around comics, as you can see right there. Um, <laughs> you can uh, obviously we're on Instagram and Twitter and all those things. All that, all those links are in the uh, the video uh, information as well. But you can. Um, you can also support the show if you'd like to support the show. I, I have a graphic for that as well. So you can support the show at aroundcomics.com. Other way, slash shop. We have all sorts of uh, good stuff there. We have we have hats, as Tom is pointing to right now, and T-shirts. I just created a new T-shirt there, the the uh, paper and pencil and pen and ink. Uh, shirt that I brand new. It's the old school coffee mug. That's the old. So we have a new one. We have a new one with a new, new logo. Actually, there's two on the uh, the website. So yeah, you can you can uh, buy a, a stuff there and support the show uh, by giving us your money. We like we like your money. That's the oh, only yeah. way. That's the only way to support the show. It's the only way. We don't we don't care if you listen. Yeah. You know, click on it, subscribe, and then give us your money. And other than that, no one cares. Yeah. So there all you right. go. There's there's uh, all that stuff. So Tom, um, um, yeah. ed- edutain us. Oh, we're looking forward to this. By the way, this is the this is the third and final uh, golden key that unlocks the door to the Tom King bonus uh, comics one hundred and one. What side the- is? <laughs> <laughs> What's his going to be on? To see, has he? Uh, uh, Adam Strange. Oh. Yes, of course. Okay. Which will be awesome. Oh. That's, right. That's right, Mr. King. So you better get your act together. We're waiting. Yeah. We're, yep. set, we're ready. 
after we this contract play the stinger again play the stinger <laughs> here we go right <laughs> sorry i missed the cue it's time for comics 101 it's edutainment starting now uh <laughs> Have any of you guys? I, I actually dug up my issues out of my closet. That's like right back here. No water damage from the flood. Nice. Surprisingly enough. So very good. Very good. Over the last two weeks, I've been rereading them uh, again, and they're long. Have you guys read? Have you yeah, guys ever read? Them? Have you guys ever read the Inglehart ones? I, I don't think I ever have, and I, I started looking at them uh, today just to try and at yeah. least have a somewhat knowledge about it, and I didn't realize they're all double-sized issues. They're big double-sized issues, right? So, um, which you probably couldn't do these days, right? So, um, all all with art by Dick Dillon, who uh, somehow managed to churn out like a double-sized comic. Still on, yeah, still on time, I guess, probably, right? Like, it, I mean, it's a crazy thing to think about, but uh, what, what year does this start? Uh, 1974, I believe. Okay. I was, I was one. uh, and you know, it, it the Inglehart's probably more, you know, if you're thinking of this time period of DC comics, you know, his he's got sort of a definitive set of Batman stories that are kind of like. Probably his like signature DC thing that he did at that time. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about the uh, the JLA comics, and he only he only did it for a year, right? So it's from issue the second story in issue one thirty nine, and one fifty is the last one. And there's two issues in there that he didn't write that were part of a crisis crossover, right? So like he didn't do a ton of issues. Now they're like double sized, so you could argue, you know, he fit a lot in within those. Which is true because it's kind of crazy to uh, read an old comic that's double sized because there's so much stuff happening. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh my god! Like, it's another fight scene. It's like you can jam in like six more fight scenes into the into the story. Um, but it, in context of like the Justice League, um, I really I, I find that the Inglehart run is really when you start to. Uh, kind of bronze age up the characters a little bit in the sense that, you know, the original sort of Gardner Fox run, the characters are all the same. There is no difference. I've said before, you can switch all the word balloons around. Doesn't make a lick of difference whatsoever. Like no one has any discernible point of view really other than like there's the justice league and then there's the bad guy. Right. And essentially the function of any justice leaguer talking at any time is to split up a caption box. That's essentially like what all their dialogue is. Right. So yeah, further the plot, they're very, yeah, very plot centric, very little characterization. And then after Gardner Fox left and you'd um, various writers had their runs on the, on the comics, such as uh, uh, Len, uh, Len Wein did a, a run on it. Carrie Bates did some. And they all sort of started moving the Justice League to be more of what I guess you would think of like a modern comic, right? Like uh, characters have points of view, you know, like Green Arrow and Hawkman don't like each other because Hawkman's conservative and Green, uh, and Green Arrow is liberal, right? So like characters start to have discerning points of view that like frame up how they interact with each other but essentially still there's not a lot of like interaction between the characters like true interaction of like what does this character think of that character what does batman and superman think of each other you know like never never comes up in a justice league comic you know like previous to that they're just like hey, they're in the justice league they all like each other right um but what is interesting about the Inglehart stuff is he really gets into like kind of what the characters think of each other, think of themselves in context of the Justice League, right? So, and like issue 139, which is like the he wrote the second story within that, right? Like the whole story, it's interesting that like if you go back and read it, a lot of the captions and stuff are about how like the Justice League really isn't a team, like they're a league that's different, right? Like they're not like this they're not totally linked together it's all these separate characters coming together to do things and like it's not always 
with, at least within the context of the way he's talking about it, like it's not like a well-oiled machine all the time. Like, they need a manager. Like, yeah, like they're not. <laughs> yeah, they're like not. They're not a team. They're a league, and there's a difference. And he kind of makes an interesting, like the dividing line between that of what the Justice League is and what it isn't. Right. So, um, and really, like that first story is is really interesting because like it sets up like what I think also is a big difference between his justice league and a lot of the previous work on the justice league is that um, they're beatable or at least they're not capable of doing everything all at once. Like they're not in previously in a lot of justice league books. It's like the question simply the matter of when the justice league knows what's happening and then they fix it. So like there's very little, like nothing can withstand them, right? They put out so fires, it, but yeah, no, yeah. It's like just the story is basically how long until they figure out there's a fire, and then like yeah. and it's up, right? So like the way the stories that he tells work is that the Justice League is in danger, or they don't know what they're doing all the time, or there's things they don't know, right? So like um, one of the stories he does early on is the Manhunters, right? The uh, precursors yeah, to under, the covers and it's like oh those are manhunters yeah previous to green lantern right so mm -hmm. like going to the whole backstory of the manhunters but the he really sets up the manhunters as like this thing that like justice league doesn't know anything about them they're like uh uh they're a threat to them right like they kind of outsmart the justice league at times and they're everywhere and they're huge and like there's people that you the, the manhunters have been hiding amongst us and it's like sort of a bigger grander vision of like what a villain for the justice league could be then they're giant robots though yeah but they're not though in these they're human sized like when they were released by the guardians to go out into the world they just acted like people and their blue skin faded so no one knew what they were i i mean there's lots of problems with it and there's like uh Both of the manhunters was like dc's version of of sentinels yeah i in the, I think it eventually became like that. Yeah. But in this version of it, they are just like they hid amongst humans as humans, and they recruited other humans to be man hunters to help them, like achieve their goals of you know world domination and getting back at the, uh, you know the Green Lantern Corps. But like it's a a bigger vision of what a villain can be than probably a lot of the previous Justice League stories. Where, you know, you, if you were to critique the Justice League, it's like, none of the, the Justice League enemies are kind of like, eh, okay. Like, if it's usually like a collection of their individual bad guys, right? And then everyone splits up and goes and does things, right? So, you start off. And Sinestro and yeah. Cheetah and Lex Luthor. And, yeah. So, like, just from the sake of just who the league faces, he's got bigger ideas of what a bad guy could be. You know, one of the foes they fight is the Construct, which is like this artificial intelligence created by all the radio waves in the air. And it can be like in any machine and it like could be anywhere. And it's just a much more bigger idea of like who the Justice League could be fighting and who could be like an actual threat to the Justice League. But then also, not only he doesn't only really change how the justice league's interaction interacting with its foes but also like how they interact with each other right so like you see moments where um wonder woman is pissed off at the other justice league members because she had just gone through the thing where she lost her powers for a while and she was just like a secret agent and now she's back and she gets real snippy with uh the flash and the flash you know his he actually has an inner monologue that has is different from what he's talking about, right? So like he's having thoughts about for, he's like for the time is different. It's yeah, yeah. Different for that character. For the Justice League. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, he's saying one thing. thing. They said what they thought. Yeah. He's saying one thing and he's like thinking another thing. He's like, oh, I'm just some like yokel from the Midwest who's like trying to talk to this Amazon princess, right? And it's like for the Justice League, that's like earth shattering for that level of characterization to happen within the book of like, oh, wait, the Flash is intimidated by Wonder Woman, you know, and then um, he does a whole issue. It's a story of Aquaman, the Adam and Elongated Man um, fighting a bad guy. 
because they essentially go on vacation because they're just kind of like, what do we do? Like sometime, you know, like our powers don't always solve every problem. They like are only helpful in very specific situations. <laughs> so, that good says. so you kind of see the three of them out in the world, like being heroes. Like, so Englehart kind of gives them their own issue of like pumping them up as heroes, but also giving them some self doubt, you know, like the Adam doubts, whether he's like, Am I really supposed to be in the Justice League? I'm just like 180 pound scientist who can like shrink down. You know, like there are times when I can't do anything, or like the elongated man, so goofy. Like, is he really a hero, or is he like he's just a, kind of a goofball? He's a, he's a well, detective. He's a tech. Well, I mean, they gave all these characters different um, like motives, right? So, like, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you start to see. A rounder uh, character, right? He he brings in Hawk Woman to be a member of the Justice League within this, right? Because it used to be you couldn't oh. have two Justice League members with the same powers because I don't know, you just made up the rules about who's in the Justice League. Right? So like, <laughs> and it's interesting because you see a lot of those themes that he's bringing in here it gets taken directly into um, the Justice League cartoons, right? Like the Manhunter story. Mm -hmm. is essentially right from the comic, right? Where Green Lantern is framed for blowing up a planet, you know? Or like the idea of of um, the white Martians get introduced in here. Like as, oh, really? as yeah, of, of like, oh, the actual first Justice League mission was helping John Jones repel like an invasion of Martians, right? So like, there's all these things sprinkled in here in these issues that get used again and again, like Red Tornado comes back and now he's like his own character and he's got like uh, his own motives of like trying to like assimilate into humanity. So it's, it's a really interesting run of comics and the fact that like in just that small amount of issues, like every issue plants the seeds of stuff that you've seen in a lot of DC entertainment. Like it's brought up again and again and again, and like you see the themes of that stuff brought up again. Yeah, like again. 73, 74. Yeah, like seventy four through maybe seventy five. I'd have to look it up off the top of my head, but like the just it's a kind of it's a kind of amazing, right? And it really set a different tone for the Justice League, or at least started to give like a reason why the Justice League. Is it interesting? Could be an interesting yeah. book to read. Is because you have these heroes who are these self-contained titans of like myth, and then what happens when you bring them together? You know, like yeah. they don't always get along super well. Batman gets beat up, which is like a weird thing. Like <laughs> stranger, uh, a manhunter beats him up, like throws him off, like. Uh, uh, off his penthouse building, but it, it's very strange because, like, it's a very different Batman than I think we now live in the era of Batman has a plan for everything and Batman can't be beat, and sure. like, he always has a plan. And it's like, this Batman got the shit beat out of him by the Manhunter and thrown off a ledge. <laughs> and the only reason he survived is because he makes sure to put a flagpole on the side of his penthouse. Well, he had. Yeah, this busy is like that's always I, I it's saved my life many times since he's always got something to grab onto when someone <laughs> throws him off the, throws him off the building. Or you even have like a moment where Batman talks about that him and Superman are a team. Like that's like they're why is Batman out in outer space with Superman? It's because they're a, the world's finest team. They work together, they're friends, right? And it's like, oh wow, I never, you know, like there's never been a Justice League comic before that that really framed it up that way in a way that like was meaningful, other than like these people are all friends. You know, Snapper Car shows up. Like Stephen Englehart really like pulls out like a bunch of stuff from the Justice League past and like recontextualizes it, and people use it again and again and again and again for years after this. Uh, we have a comment that leads right into that. Uh, a Johnson on YouTube says uh, Grant Morrison took a lot from this run for Final Crisis and Seven Soldiers, especially. Yeah. And yeah, so, your point is, uh, you yeah, know, right I mean, there. there's a lot of of threads from this that get pulled out and like used. You know, like the idea of like they killed off Red Tornado is sort of like, yeah, whatever, got rid of him. 
like had him blow himself up to like save Earth One during one of the crises, and then Stephen Lark kind of plucks him back during and, like, one of the crises. Up. Yeah, and like sets him back up as like an interesting character, and like gives him like uh, uh, you know like an interesting motive for why he should exist. You know, like he wants to you know assimilate with humans, and he's got his own like motives for things, and it's just. It's really an incredible exercise in sort of like plucking these very like interesting little threads and then giving them a new context to it. And I always love Dick Dillon art, you know. It's just like classic Justice League sort of, you know. It's uh, kind of a house style, but kind of, you know, help define those characters. How long was Englehart on JLA? It was just for those issues from 139 to 150. With two fill in, two crises issues, he didn't write in there, and that was it. So it was a very small so, run of comics. So not quite as long as the Neil Adams, Roy Thomas run on X Men, which means that Sal's not going to give you as much shit as he gave. Me. <laughs> well, I mean, at least they're double issues. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I guess I, I will I, say it's a little sad that so far the longest run of any of our comics 101s that we've done has been mine with fucking star girl so yeah. you know <laughs> but the Engelhart issues are incredibly significant just in like the book being interesting it's yeah. like a turning point of like oh like so you, you can have them really more about quality over quantity <laughs> and wow. it's if you say so, if you say so. I mean, it is incredible how good, how much is packed into each issue that comes up again. Like, it is, there's no issue where it's like, oh, no one ever talks about that character ever again. It's like, somehow everything he did got used again and, like, picked up and blown out. So it is amazing in that sense of, like, oh, my God, like, he introduced so much stuff that all, like, seems so important. Um, there's a, a interesting, I, I, as I was searching around for stuff today, I happened to come across Ingle, Steve Englehart's uh, website, Steve, uh, steveinglehart.com, and there's actually a, a, an interesting little uh, essay he wrote about these issues and sort of what they led into and, and, and even what you had said, like, you know, it often gets overlooked because of his Batman work. Uh, but it, you know, he thought it was a pretty, pretty good run of, of stuff. So people might want to go there at, uh. SteveEnglehart.com. I can. I'll, I'll post the uh, link for it. But um, uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, we do have a question mm -hmm. uh, from Mr. Johnson again. Uh, he asked, "Did the Batman Superman animosity come from Frank Miller?" Uh, I don't know. I mean, I definitely was there. Certainly, I was aware as a comic fan of them being at odds with each other. And, you know, I go back to, to Frank Miller interviews. It's like, you know, if you look at them, you know, obviously they would be at odds with each other. They're ideologically opposed to each other. That was the first time. And this is also like 12 year old Chris. That's the first time that I can ever remember Batman and Superman being, of opponents being, you know, argumentative to each other, still, you know, on the same side, but but um, opposed ideologically on in, in ways. So, you know, to, to my knowledge, yes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I mean, I couldn't really answer it intelligently, to be honest. I I, I don't know whether or not it was. It certainly is in there, but. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that was the first, I don't. I can't imagine that's the first time. Like, because, I mean, you had. I mean, you certainly had a different kind of Batman before that. I don't know that they ever had animosity, but I'm sure there were times where they maybe didn't agree. Sure. With things, so, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know about. I don't and know about these. From like you know slapping on the kryptonite fucking gloves and and going at it. Well, yeah, but I don't even know. Would you even call it animosity in the in the Batman in the Frank Miller stuff? I mean, it was. I mean, he. I mean, he still trusted Clark enough to save his life. I, I mean, once again, I think they were on the same side, but they were right. 
ideologically opposed to each other from you know big big picture um you know politically what they were allowed for the government to to be involved in etc i think that they were ideologically opposed but i think to a man they still respected each other right uh an old friend uh, popped up on periscope jason d kim from hawaii aloha from hawaii i love the show please go keep up the great work there's two alohas aloha aloha yeah. aloha Oha means uh, hello and goodbye yeah, yeah right wow i don't think i've ever seen it actually used that way used Thanks. used in all of its glory <laughs> I like I love this. Uh, if, you know, for people that haven't been watching the show or are new to it, it uh, this sort of new interaction that we have with people watching live, it's kind of interesting that they can comment and and we can kind of respond, you know, in real time with them, which is is kind of neat. It's a little it's a little nerve wracking because I'm sitting here <laughs> trying to <laughs> get stuff in, but I, you know, it, it's interesting. Yeah. For... So so Tom, out of out of all of the, the the you know tons of JLA runs, where do you put the Inglehart run? Is it is it like you know a top five for you? Is it something that you go back and revisit often because of the themes? You know where where do you put it in your your JLA reading? Because you've you've read a lot of JLA comics. Yeah, I I'd, I'd put it like in the you know top ten. Definitely top five, maybe of like I don't know if I read them all the time, but as far as mm -hmm. significance of like how much a single creative team sort of can alter like the trajectory of what a book can be, like it's certainly in, in very significant. Like it's hard to think of in a short amount of time. In a short amount of time of like a, kind of like Roy Thomas and Neil Adams. Like of a, it's hard to think of something besides. I'm just jabbing. Cri crisis. <laughs> Something besides like Justice League Detroit. No, of uh, being a bigger like shift in oh, what yeah. the book was, you know, like of tone wise and like story wise, and uh, well, that was a complete departure. I mean, this is still core members. Yeah, but it, as far as like Justice League pre crisis, like runs of significance it's this one and then you know there's some other you know the george perez stuff obviously mm -hmm. is pretty is, is great but probably not as sort of like whoa what happened you know sort of like ground shifting and how the book went going forward yeah it's um i guess we still kind of deal with that a little bit with, with comics now but i mean that was i remember the there was a time where it was a huge deal when a big time creative team would take over a new book mm -hmm. and now it's just so common that everyone has their like six issue run or yeah. whatever um yeah but i remember it was a it was a big deal when you know wolfman and perez would take over something you know and it seemed to be teams it was yeah. You know, and I, I kind of miss that with comics a little bit. You want that big deal. You want someone to come in and just, just shake it all up. Yeah. <laughs> oh back. Just uh, destroy it. I mean, probably the, the the last time it was it was Morrison. When Morrison would come on to a book, it was guaranteed that he was gonna you know flip it on its head and 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 completely change that. And he did that with JLA. I mean, that's one of the books that. But even though I looking back at that time, and and once again, Tom, you were probably reading JLA at that mm -hmm. at that time. Was Morrison kind of known for coming in and completely, just absolutely um, flipping things on their head? I don't remember that kind of being his mo until X Men. Well, also, the just Justice League was just a fucking mess before yeah. he, he like. The you know, the as someone who's read a lot of Justice League books, most Justice League books on the grand scale of comics are fairly boring. <laughs> like there's <laughs> moments where you know the um, the ha ha Justice League, you know, after Crisis, you know, mm -hmm. which you know is to me probably the still the best Justice League run, just as far as like 
something that feels yeah, Giffen stuff, Giffen McGuire. Yeah, just like totally modern could come out now. Totally modern, like so far ahead of its time as far as like um tone and, and, and funny. And funny, funny. Totally yeah. Just like funny this. comic book. Yeah. I don't know that I had read one like that before that. Like yeah. that actual, you know, sort of like a, you know, I, I mean it was a comedy. It was a comedy yeah. book. It was hilarious. I mean, the thing with Justice League is it's always sort of rife for that, like because when it's done badly, it gets really boring really quickly, right? So it's sort of like, so when someone does come in, you know, like a, like this Englehart run, or even at post crisis, if we're going to talk post crisis Justice League, like when someone new comes in or uh, Morrison and just like totally revamps it, and it's like, oh, this can be good, right? Like because when it gets bad, it gets really bad, and it gets really boring, and it gets really like yeah. just like. Ugh. What is happening? Because inevitably, well, you go through the whole cycle of all these team books where it's like, oh, you need to have the seven greatest heroes in it. And then they're like, what if it wasn't the seven greatest heroes? What right. if we had seven? And then everyone's like, why do, why do we have these seven people in it? Why don't we just have that? So it's like always like a churning cycle of like, <laughs> you need to have the iconic ones. And it's like, ah, what Let's if we did one without the icon? You know, so it's like constantly turning. It's I have uh, I have seven uh, seven mini statues in my office, and guess who they are. <laughs> <laughs> and this is always constantly mm -hmm. like that team in that book is always like it's in a churn of like how do we. Uh, the seven, you know, the seven main Justice Leaguers is boring. Let's get some new people in here. It's like, ah, these new people, now they're boring. Let's get the other seven back, you know, and you're just always trying to find new angles on how to, like, make these characters interesting work, uh, being together, right? So I think it's going to be, I mean, inherently just difficult to write that many characters in a book and and keep anything fresh and interesting and yeah. you know involve them all and try and and still tell a story and it, that's got to be hard to do i mean the, i've never been that big of a fan of team books because of it because a lot of times it's just like ah you know this, this is kind of boring i, I just kind of want to concentrate on one you know one it's character two characters and not like this whole group that you know is sort of convoluted and it's always i think the justice league is like a tough book because like who you you have to be so careful of like what kind of foes you have them face like is it's like you don't want to fall in the gardner fox world where it's like the justice league vanquishes the foe as soon as they figure out what's happening you know like right it's it, it's easy to fall back into that and like yeah you know if you think of justice league like pure Justice League foes, you know, like, I think of Amazo who can kind of do some interesting stories. But yeah, I mean, like, a lot of their enemies have been sort of dark side in a sense as a Justice League foe, but he's really a Superman foe, you know, like, what was that? Starro. Yeah, Starro, I mean, Starro looks, right? Star looks fucking rad. Yeah. But like, he's not going to do anything. Other than just like hover over your city and drop a bunch of like tiny starros. I mean, it looks cool as hell. It's a great like yeah, yeah. like design element in a. Well, comic. even when the, they're on, you know, the face hugger yeah, it's, it's yeah, awesome. It's great. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. It's like you're not going to get a ton of story out of Starro though, other than well, like yeah. Sort of like, uh, Didn't someone do a kind of interesting Starro take on Starro where it was like uh, it wasn't like the face yeah. hugger thing? It was awesome. So didn't who did that? What was that story? Shit, was that was that a like a mystery in space? Tom, I remember you loved it. It was like yeah, it was like I Star can't remember the warrior. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm have to dig it up and figure it out. Ah, uh, it was so good. Yes, Sal, you're right. Mm. Yeah, there was a cool that was a cool story. I remember. I don't yeah. remember what it was exactly, but um, <laughs> yeah. I, that that was pretty cool. I mean, it's always something. I think. I mean, I think Inglehart had the right idea, though. It's like you know. I, it's easier probably to write stories about like the difficulties of working with, you know, seven, eight different people that all yeah. have their own things going on. And, and, and especially like, I, you know, I, it's kind of one of the things I love about uh, the boys, you yeah. know, is the idea of like, yeah, just because these people 
are superheroes and they're working together. They they probably have gigantic egos and you know do not like each other. They all have their yeah. own agendas and yeah. their own things. And it's like that could be a real. I mean, the, the boys gets into it a little bit, yeah, know, over the top yeah. way. But I think like in a serious way, you could do that. Not necessarily with a Justice League, but with like a team book where it's like, you know, what's it like working with a bunch of, you know, different heroes that, you know, have their own kind of egos to deal with. Uh, and I think Justice League, um, uh, what's the one, uh, Justice League Europe, right? Yeah. The That kind of dealt with that because you had Booster and Guy Gardner and, you know, those those characters were you know those personalities were difficult to deal with sometimes mm -hmm. they didn't mesh together yeah perfectly all the time so yeah i mean i mean i think that's an interesting i mean it's an interesting way of looking at what Englehart did with it right is like having you know like the flash and wonder woman don't get along because like why would they like they've got nothing in common you know like the Flash is like a police scientist from the Midwest and Wonder Woman's like a, a goddess, you know? So like, sure. why would the two of them like fit together perfectly or work together? You know, well, that, I felt that like in, in new frontier with Darwin, you know, cook did. And it was like, you know, his presentation of Wonder Woman, she was this goddess and very aloof. And, and to some degree, I mean, she was also a little body and, and, you know, yeah could drink you under the table kind of thing. But yeah, I was like, what would she possibly have in common with, with these, you know, characters? And, and you saw that with, you know, Green Lantern didn't quite, you know, Hal didn't quite fit in with some of, you know, with Batman. It was kind of a weird relationship. Batman doesn't get along with anyone. Yeah. You know, and, and you would have Superman and Wonder Woman sort of as these standoff characters that, yeah. you know, are God, literal gods on earth yeah. and, and Batman, like, okay. You know, uh, how, how does that <laughs> dynamic, yeah. how would that actually work? I like that Adam's like, all I do is shrink. <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> he did a story about that. Where it's like, I shrink. I shrink. Like, it's, all I got, I, it's all I got, guys. I'm in the Justice League. You know, the, and giving the character like that, you know, like, yeah, he's just like a scientist. Right. Like, you know, like he would probably be like, why the fuck am I in the justice league? You know, like, well, well, that was a thing. Like I love the, the DC legends of tomorrow, that show mm -hmm. I, I thought of the CW shows. That was my favorite. Other than, the flash was great. I love legends because it's ridiculous. Legends is ridiculous. But the thing that kind of annoyed me sometimes was like, they, they would always have to, the writers would always have to find a way to not send in their most powerful, yeah, because oh, yeah. the story yeah. would just be over. Like they were, you know, it's like they got to figure out how to not uh, send in Adam because he's got that freaking. They gave him, you know, Iron Man armor, and it's like, well, if he's in this story, Sorry. he's, he's going to be over pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he's, the Avengers did that for years. It's like you have to make a story and keep Thor away from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's just it. Like you can't. You have to write them out of it, and so it's it's tough. I mean. Uh, I, I understand that you know that sometimes that's just going to lead to weird shit. You know, like there's just no way around it. Yeah, Superman cannot be here for this. He must be off planet. Yeah, how do you yeah. have Superman in anything? You know, uh, you know. I think a lot of the Justice League stories were like, uh, you know, like something well i mean like look at um it's not justice league story but it's the alan moore whatever happened to the man of tomorrow where yeah. the whole story is is superman's catatonic you know he's he's yeah. you know he's not even in it barely until the end um you know and that kind of thing like where they have to just keep him out of it uh as much as they can stay out of this superman stay out stay out of this story or you're going to ruin it but you know like the <laughs> was that the, the... yeah like the function the of like the... um, um... sorry i was bringing up um uh we had another commenter uh said that the justice league of, of american 190 is the cover with the mini sparrows on their faces and you can see that said yeah that's an awesome cover it's just like all of them yeah, yeah, that just looks cool. Like, like you said, I don't know. 
it, you know, if he's a great villain or not, but it looks cool. He right? looks cool, which is like 75% of being a good villain. I gotta there. find that one comic where where it was Starro as a really different kind of villain. Um, yeah, I can't remember it, but it was it was a different take on Starro where it was like I don't know. I kind of want to see Starro as like a you know, like a slick uh marketing guy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see Everybody. that. <laughs> it's just like you know, convinces people to do things against their nature. Star <laughs> that, that, Johnny Starro. I <laughs> mean, uh, glorious Godfrey. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> the dark sides publicity person. Something like that. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I have I don't know that I've ever actually read the Inglehart run on Justice League. I, I I'm gonna ha now I want to go back and read all those uh giant size. Are those are those tough issues to get? Are they like are they expensive? Are they any idea if they're I don't know. They weren't when I got them. Yeah. They, they're just kind of around. I don't know what status the they're at like. now. Yeah, what the market's like for it now. But. I wonder. That'd be fun to just like pick that run up and have those laying around, you know. I mean, they do have a story where they, I mean, they do reference the fact that they jammed an alien inside, like, the computer of the Justice League satellite. <laughs> like, they just fought a, an alien. Ah. To defeat it, they just, like, jammed it into the computer. <laughs> and it's just, like, murder. Curled, yeah, and it's just, like, curled up inside, and it keeps the Justice League satellite running correctly. because Like, like Snowpiercer? Like, one yeah, of the kids like, in Snowpiercer? Like, the alien is balancing out, like, the deficiencies of the Justice League computer, which is really That's, immensely fucked up. That, that is it, horribly uh, fucked up. Has, like, this alien imprisoned inside the computer. Wow. The I won't spoil how it ties in the rest of it, but I'm like, Steve Englehart must have thought that was fucking crazy, too, because he brought it back. Like, oh, yeah, there's, like, an alien, like, just, like, jammed into the computer desk. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you lift the screen up, it's, like, face is, like, right there, just, like. That's hilarious. It's like, oh, my so, God. The, the, the run uh, with Starro that we're thinking was in Rebels. Oh. Which okay. was great. Rebels was a great book. Rebels was a fantastic book. Yeah. So if you if you have a chance, and that was the that was a really different take on Starro as a bad guy, and it was freaking awesome. My son's got a um a book where Starro takes over the mind of the president of the United States. But that's not fiction. Yeah, and he's like, "Is the president a bad guy?" And I'm like, uh, yeah. "Most of the time, no." Oh well, you know he's just he's just misunderstood. Are you talking about Starro? <laughs> yeah, Starro. <laughs> Starro is misunderstood. Starro. President Starro. <laughs> oh well, yeah, that's 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 cool. I'm gonna yeah, I want I want to I want to read those books. Those I don't think I I think I have I might have one or two, but I don't think I have all of them. He, I don't know. He, I have to go. He jammed a lot into it each issue. I'm like, damn, there's a lot of there's a lot in 34 pages. Of you know, 1974 <laughs> comic is like a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of exposition, my that's friend. A lot of action is going. I wonder on. If, it, if it's uh collect it collected at all. It's not that I I am not I I looked before okay. the show, but I didn't see collected anywhere. Oh. Maybe it's in a showcase. If the showcase has ever got that high, I don't know. I don't think they got that far for. Uh, there looks like there is. I'm just I'm just googling right now. Oh no, this isn't a collector. Somebody talking about it? No, I don't see anything. Well, maybe now there will be. Now that now that we brought it up, it's get... um, the, the now, did we come back and write Justice League again, like uh, Justice League Classified or something like that? He might have. Yeah, yeah. He came, he came back. He came back later, I believe. I'm looking it up now. Looking, typing, googling, typing, googling, and, uh, googling. Well, while Tom is uh, doing that, I uh, I'm gonna run our little uh, thing here. You know, don't forget to uh, to subscribe and comment below, and and you can email us at info at aroundcomics.com. Please subscribe if you're if you're watching this on YouTube. Please subscribe. We need we need to hit. Uh, a mark the next like goal is like a hundred subscribers, and that unlocks like our URL. We can actually have 
a custom URL. This is how weird YouTube oh, is. shit. <laughs> yeah, I know. We unlock a prize. <laughs> woo -hoo. You know, so unlock the next level of content. Yes. <laughs> uh, he, he wrote JLA Classified uh, for like three issues in JSA Classified. Okay. But he also wrote Green Lantern Corps. Um, can't, yeah, from issue 201 to 223. He wrote uh, Green Lantern for a little while in the mid-80s. Was that when Hal was uh, an insurance agent? It was post-insurance agent. Okay. Um, uh, you know, of course, did Detective Comics uh, for a while. Is he still alive? I think so. Yeah, right? Yeah, he, he is. He is. I wasn't sure. Steve, oh. if you're out there, my friend. <laughs> if you're watching. If you're Steve, watching, you're leave a comment. <laughs> I'm, I'm alive. still alive. I'm, I'm still alive. Assholes. <laughs> Oh well, that's uh, that's cool. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna check that stuff out. Go check it out, guys. Now, now you know. Now you know. It's now you know. Uh, um. So that's that's our third comics 101. That's our challenge met Tom King. So uh, you uh, you are now you owe us a Adam Strange comics 101. So we'll we'll see about <laughs> getting Tom King on the show again and and having him tell us all about Adam Strange. I'd imagine he did a bunch of research considering he's writing an Adam Strange book. Kind of, yeah. it, all the work was done. All the yeah. work was done. Yeah. What do you mean? Someone did it for him. He, he hasn't started writing a, an Adam Strange book. Oh, hey, who knows, man? You, you know, so have you read some of his work? He may sure. just wing it. He just true. <laughs> I'm just gonna, you know. Well, he wrote, gets all of his ideas from Julian Weidel. Apparently, apparently he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, be nice. He's not gonna come back if you don't. If you don't be nice. He'll, he'll come back. He'll come. <laughs> I, 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 I trust and I believe in Tom King. Um, Tom, you missed it. I've been cleaning out my basement. Oh wow. <laughs> What'd you find? Lucky you. <laughs> Do we have a live stream of that? <laughs> uh, can watch Chris clean it's amazing bit. what people on the internet are interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. I did find these two little treasures. You remember these guys? History of what? It's the history of the DC universe. Ah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I kind of remember them. Not, not really. I don't remember but, those particular books, though. It, it's the... I think this... This would have been the first like time I bought a prestige comic, which was basically not a, a saddle stitched or or, or stable yeah. comic. Well, uh, it is a history book. It so. is a history book. And <laughs> are, okay, so Tom, this is the difference between you and me as as comic book fans. Um, I grew up. I was a Marvel kid, right? Um, I was basically X Men, and then got into. You know, Avengers, Captain America, that that kind of stuff. Um, crisis happens in 1986, and DC put out this two yep. issue series called History of the DC Universe, which was, if you read these, it is them basically relaying out the history of the DC Universe post crisis. Mm -hmm. Like this is now the history. Of of the universe, and they never changed it again. <laughs> that was <laughs> it. Done. Yeah, it done. Set it, it stuck to it. No it's been fungible. <laughs> it's, yeah, extremely. <laughs> now it's just like ah, uh, what? It all happened. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you want. Whatever you want. <laughs> it's just. But what was cool is written by a by a, a, a Wolfman. Uh, and illustrated by George Perez, and so it's it's a beautiful comic. Um, but this was for me. This was the history of the DCU. This was kind of like the first time I set aside to say, okay, I'm going to learn what this universe of, of comic is. So this it's is a this yeah, is history, and it was never going to change. And I never have to learn anything new. Well, it gave me all the cliff notes I need yeah. to jump in because. Basically, I started reading the DCU with um, like Batman Year One and um, John Burns. 
uh, Superman. Mm -hmm. And I kind of jumped in with that. So it was kind of neat to walk down memory lane finding these. And it's, oh, yeah, in 1986, this was the definitive history of the DCU. One could argue crisis has never stopped happening since 1986. They kind of keep happening. I mean, it's kind of just constantly. It's yeah. interesting how characters like Vigilante and Manhunter are prominently um, featured. Well, in this there is a new vigilante book coming out you got hey, he's obviously an important piece of dc history i loved vigilante yeah that book was i mean 1986 87 88 vigilante was you're like hell I yeah alan moore wrote vigilante mm -hmm. some good ones that is true alan moore wrote uh and uh an it's issue. true I wasn't yeah. calling you a liar. I wasn't. <laughs> Listen, you liar. Bullshit. Listen. Bullshit. He never lying, wrote that. Man. You're lying. He never wrote it. It was a. Alan Moore wrote Vigilante. Quit lying. Did he? What? Is, yeah, he 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 didn't write the book though. He wrote the character. He wrote he wrote an issue of the comic. Did he write it? And there he goes again. Chris is off. He's, he's, he's been mad. he's been running in and out of camera. Comics 101. Alan Moore's Vigilante. <laughs> One issue. One issue. We're gonna, I'm, just gonna read it. One. I'm just gonna read it to you. Hey, that'd probably get a lot of numbers, man. People yeah. throw that on YouTube. Just like just holding it up, just like here's what happens. <laughs> Here it is. That's the comics. That's Chris's next one. Comics one oh one. Vigilante by Alan Moore. Issue number. I don't. I don't remember. I don't know. He's he's searching for it. He left. He left. <laughs> Jesus. He's gone. Oh boy. This has been uh, quite um did he? Uh, uh an interesting already. He wrote who wrote he wrote two issues. He's lying. He wrote uh yeah, 17 and 18, I think. He's in a closet somewhere. Ugh. Oh, too bad. We really wanted you to read it to us as your next comment. No, I was gonna find out what issue it was. 17 and 18. Well, there you go. See? Yeah. Um, it's there's actually a collected edition of it. Yeah. What the it fuck? Was, it was awesome. I'm telling you. It's in the DC Alan Moore that trade. That's all his like DC. Oh, I was looking for the DC mm. stories or Alan Moore's DC yeah. DC story. Yeah, I think I have that somewhere. I'm not gonna go searching for it. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Here, let me just put everything on pause and go. wait, everyone. I'll be right back. You all were fucking entertaining enough to keep everyone going while I was looking for a, a trade. Oh. A. Johnson didn't think you were coming he back. He ain't coming so. back. He yeah. walked off. <laughs> uh, do you guys want to read? Uh, I have a, a listener email we can, uh, we can read. All right. Let's see here. Where are we at? This is from Chris. And Chris said, uh, hey, guys, liked your brief discussion on Kickstarter. I'm not sure uh, about your views, but I have noticed lately that creators are cross-funding books between both Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And in doing so, it seems the Kickstarters are being funded but not coming out for months after the initial date because of Indiegogo campaigns and extended funding continuously going. For instance, a creator and friend of mine did a campaign for a well-known indie character on both platforms. It was done months ago, with March being the release. Yet every update was about the uh, Indiegogo funding going strong and adding more stretch goals. However, earlier this week, he sent an update because he had had numerous complaints. Now suddenly, the surveys have gone out and orders will be fulfilled within coming days. Just curious on your observations and thought on this, Chris. Well, thanks, Chris, for sending us an email. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that, really. I guess it is kind of strange if you're cross-funding a, you know, book. I mean, the whole point is like, you know, on Kickstarter, you have the date that this is going to be done, and you haven't told them to fund it. So, yeah, that's a little odd. But... I, would, I would be skeptical of anything that is cross-crowdfunding over different platforms. That's just my take. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Lane, I guess. I mean, I'm not going to blame anybody for trying to sell something that's their, you know, they sell their comic. Mm -hmm. They can sell it. I don't, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily nefarious. I don't know that they're trying to. Mm -hmm. What if one succeeds? What if one fails? And 
and then you know the say if it if it's funded on Kickstarter but not on Indiegogo, then who gets their books and all that kind of yeah. That's I, it, pick a fucking lane. Whoa, relax, Chris. It's not that serious, you know. You look lane. I want my books. Chris is gonna start hitting the streets. He's gonna go protest for no Indiegogo Kickstarter yeah, yeah, yeah. cross. Just, just pick oh. one. That's fine. Crowdsource. Great. Start your door in. I'm gonna kickstart your door in and come get my book. <laughs> All right, play the stinger. I done kick them out. <laughs> kick out the jams, man. Kickstart yeah, the jams. Kickstart the jams. <laughs> my my theory about Kickstarter is I just you know I I never give more than i'm willing to just like lose <laughs> it's like going to vegas yeah it it's not, yeah i don't bring money in it that i can't lose it's not a store it's like not, not a 40 dollar break point on kickstarter yeah it's like not a store right like things can happen they can fuck it up and not finish yeah. the thing right yeah. like yeah. there's no guarantee it's a it's, it's always like anytime when i donate to anything on, if you have successfully Funded and paid to a Kickstarter that has not been delivered in over three years. Well, yeah, there's probably one. I'd have to. I probably forgot about it. Yeah, I'll get it someday and be like, just go, just go check your account. Be like, oh shit, yeah, that it's someone I like. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't have any Kickstarters. I, I did want to mention that uh, you know, if you have a Kickstarter. That you'd like us to talk about, send it to me, info at aroundcomics.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if it's something that looks kind of cool, we'll we'll bring we'll put it on the show, not necessarily, you know, uh advocate for it, but yeah, you know, at there's least different people. there's different tiers. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> if you if you send us candy, yeah, tier one, <laughs> that's tier one. That's a tier one. <laughs> that means we talk about it. Tier two. We, we recommend people donate and tier three we we ourselves donate to it yeah. we we will ourselves back it and then every week we'll contact you with updates donate. So I'm, i have uh i do I, I have some people sending in like indie comics and stuff i have to forward you guys that stuff um because i have had some people send some stuff in so i haven't had a chance to read any of it i don't know if it's good or not but that too, if you guys want to send us stuff uh, to take a look at, we're more than happy to. You can you can uh, email us at info to comics, or you can um, mail it to us. The links are our address. We have a PO box. You can mail stuff to. If you like. PO box? Yes, we have a PO box. Wow, <laughs> we're like a professional thing here, Chris. Jeez, <laughs> kind of, sort of professional. Look what else I found in my basement this week. Creature from the Black Lagoon. Lagoon. Is that Tony Moore? No. Oh, that's Art Adams. Art oh. Adams. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's basically uh it's basically Art Adams doing the uh the entire um Creature from the Black Lagoon movie. Our uh, our friend uh John Suntress has popped in and said hello on the uh, on the YouTube. Hey John, what's happening? <laughs> I just what's talked to John on? recently. <laughs> I was on I was on his show mm -hmm. for the first time. John had me on. It was a lot of fun. We talked about uh we talked uh, uh about um DC leaving Diamond Comics. I got to meet Rich Johnson for the first time and talked with him and Patrick about it. It was it was interesting. It was a it was a good talk. Go you guys go on Word Balloon, you can watch that. And uh it was it was I had a lot of fun with those guys. Did a fight break out? No, not at all. It was very civil. Everybody was very civil. It was, it yeah. was, you know, all uh, John. You know, kept everybody cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, Comics I'm, distribution gets yeah. people riled. People get up. upset. Yeah. Oh yeah, people get upset for sure. It was, uh, it was uh, interesting. It was interesting. It, it was an interesting talk actually, because I kind of went into it being the contrarian to some degree like no <laughs> you know me how, how Mr. Agreeable. Yeah, I mean, who would have thought that would and uh unpredictable and then uh yeah i uh i 
by the end of it, I was like, okay, these guys have a point. Like, this is not a good thing necessarily. It, certainly not in the short term. It's not a good thing for comic shops, and it could be really bad for comic shops in the long term, depending on what DC's objective with it all is. But that's you know to crush everything to <laughs> to churn just like just... to destroy comics entirely. That's finally. Finally, Finally, someone's going to do it. <laughs> the time's come. Well, it's it's coming been a long end. time coming, Tom. We had a good run, everyone, yeah. but they're going to do it. They're going to blow the whole thing up. I I, I think things will, will change, and yeah. people will still make comics. Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't think I think it's more about the direct market. I think it's more about whether or not we're going to have comic book stores and 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 how that's going to be. I mean, I think you're always going to have comic book stores to a certain yeah. degree. It's just a matter of how many. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you have record stores for Christ's sake. It still exists. So I can't see how comic book stores. But there is I mean, there is, you know, a lot of people are concerned that D.C. This is sort of D.C.'s, you know, first move towards no longer really supporting single issue comics and no longer supporting the direct market and going more towards books and and book sales and and scholastica and and you know mass market trade paperback sales that kind of thing i i mean for them it's probably uh a good thing business wise because there's way more money in that than there is in the direct market i think but um yeah, it, it, I mean, I don't know what it means for for comic shops in the long run. We'll see. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting year. I think that that comic even, even more interesting than it already. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, <laughs> you know, well, uh, Christ, to add on another crisis. Yeah, it, you know, here comes the river of blood. Yeah. Um, uh, comics were going to have to change what they were doing anyway, or they were going to go away. And we all know good comic shops out there. We all know bad comic shops out there. And the ones that kind of had it figured out and, and how to develop community and really engage their, their customers and their consumers, they're going to continue to exist. The ones that aren't able to adapt out of this are going to have problems. But you know what? They were going to have problems no matter who they were buying their comics from. There will always be bad comic book shops. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there are always you will always be able to find a weird comic book shop that's like darkly lit. Darkly lit. It's sort of dank. Like no, no. might be a hoarder's play. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Like a very thin line there. There will always be at least one terrible comic book shop somewhere in the United States that you can <laughs> <laughs> now you can go visit and be like, like oh. Oh. <laughs> I like I like comics and I even I'm like, oh, let's get out and of you're here. gonna go in there because somewhere in that comic book shop is something that you want. Yeah, yeah. And no one will help you find it. Yeah, that, I don't whole, know. that whole Ingr Inglehart run of JLA yeah. in there in a long box. I I have these sun bleached comics out for a reason in the window. All right. There's no reason to move all that stuff around I've... <laughs> i know i know exactly the comic shop you're talking about Tom. Yeah, there's no reason. <laughs> it's in oak park illinois <laughs> yeah. listen there's it's a method to the madness but don't worry there'll always be a bad comic book shop you can go yeah that'll don't, make you feel weird when you walk in don't you worry no matter where dc <laughs> comics, there's going to be a bad comic no, shop. No matter what happens, there will be one bad. There will be one comic book shop that exists that you're like, how? How does this place stay in business? I've never seen anyone walk out of here. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a there's a small weird bakery by us, and for years my wife was like, that has to be a drug front. Front. There's <laughs> how is that place? And no one ever goes in there. They don't have anything in the in, in the windows. Yeah. How, how is that place in business? I've, I've never seen a person walk in. I've never seen a person walk out. I can't see anybody from the door. Like, is there anyone in here? Like, is there? There's no register. I, it's just. Hey, we all you know at one point loved going to the comic shop. So you know, I I don't I just don't know if if. Uh, you know, the, the, the hard thing is, is, you know, 
right now you have good shops that are struggling, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the bad part is, 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 yeah, the bad shops are struggling, but good shops are too. And and there are good shops, but yeah, it's, it, and this doesn't make it any easier for them. I don't think, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. Um, so we'll see, but I don't know. You know, like I said, there's a lot of negativity with this decision and there's a lot of people like assuming that it's DC, like basically, you know, snubbing their nose at the direct market and comic shops and just like being fuck it we're done with you and we're going after the the smile audience yeah. you know which you know as a corporation that's that's what they're going to do they're going to go where the money isn't it it you know unfortunately it makes sense for them it's not you know it's not a great thing for the uh community you know but you got to you gotta get in that scholastic catalog, my friend. That's where all the magic is. <laughs> That's where the kids are. You gotta get it to the kids. It's for the children. Sure. It's for the children. If you want children to read them, like for real, like my son pours over the scholastic <laughs> catalog. Like, I, my, kid, my kid has definitely read more uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid and Dog Man than yep. he has single issue comic books. You know, like gotta get in that scholastic catalog. <laughs> Look at Chris drinking from the old old mug. What do you got in that mug, Chris? I'm thinking it's scotch. Is that is that full of scotch? <laughs> oh wow, you've really gone uh, native, huh? You a what, coffee what? mug full of highlight. A coffee mug full of high life. <laughs> life behind the curtain, my friends. <laughs> oh boy, I didn't think. Uh, uh, you know, you were, you were, I thought you would maybe maintain some level of sanity going up there, but apparently that has not happened. You are, you are just yeah, no, a, baby. a Bucks baby. fan. Wow. They don't even play basketball anymore. Basketball's done. It's They're over. Back. They're coming back. Are you going to be a Packers fan now? Are you going to be wearing an Aaron Rodgers jersey? No, I'll never root for the Packers. It's really, you know, the, on, on a serious and sad note, this was shaping up to be like the year of Milwaukee. You know, they had the Bucks, who were undoubtedly the best team in, in the NBA. They've got the, the Democratic National Convention coming here mm. in the summer. You know, the summer fest. And, and I mean, this was going to be an amazing year to, to live in Milwaukee. I was going to tailgate at the DNC. I, we, my wife and I were, were volunteering. Get some brats out there in the parking lot. Yeah. Slam four or five high lives. Yeah. Uh, Talk about political platforms. Play, yeah. play some corn. Yeah. Would have been great. Well, it's going to be like $430 million of revenue into the city. So, um, uh, yeah. it's uh, 2020 was supposed to be awesome. Yeah. Well, you guess what? Dave Enrique. Dave Enrique. Yeah. Guess what, guys? 2020 sucks. 2020s. <laughs> it's not good. Sorry, None not of good. those good things are happening. Guess what? It doesn't matter comics, where you live. It's comics, happening everywhere. Comics are done. It's over. <laughs> Sorry. Civilization as we know yeah, it. I, pretty you much. Know, you're worried about comic book stores. I don't know. I can't get toilet paper. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Someone burned down the liquor store. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you know, that's like, that's worse than burning down a church. What, the, what yeah. is wrong with these yeah. it, It's Why? funny. Liquor, liquor stores untouched. <laughs> yeah. Comics are over, guys. Yeah. Add that on to the pandemic and uh, the riots. Police brutality. Police brutality, comics ending, pandemic. <laughs> One of those things <laughs> doesn't fit in. More shit I found in my uh, in my uh, basement. I gotta come up with a stinger for show and tell. Chris's show and tell. Chris grabbing just here. I got. Look at my phone. Look at that. I got. Uh, let's see. What do I got here? This is relevant. It's relevant. Okay. Go ahead. No. Look at. Look at without a head. <laughs> oh, nice. I got star. This is the closest thing to me. Starman. Um, we're now, this is, we're just pulling books off shelves. Just yeah. like, hey, look at this. We're, all right, go ahead, Chris. So this is on Netflix now, right? 
Uh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, Last Days of American Crime is a movie on Netflix, apparently. I didn't yeah. know. I never, uh, is it good? I never read it. Um, It's like eight years old. Um, It's from Ender. And, uh, mean, it's, that's, <laughs> that's a strange answer to that. That's <laughs> <laughs> Rick Remender wrote like eight years ago. It's not it's right. Good? It's a it's eight years old. Yeah, it's eight years old. Is that like a wine or a cheese? <laughs> then is it is it getting better? It's a crime book that Remender wrote like you know way before I like moved like two houses. We ago. don't know. We don't remember if it's good or bad, but we do know it's from Radical. You remember Radical Publishing? So was the point of that to hope that Rick Remender is watching this and <laughs> for him to Rick. know that you still have? No, no, Rick, no. are you out there? We I had actually seen the last days of American Crime on Netflix. Leave a comment down here. <laughs> Has anyone seen the last days of American Crime? Has anyone read the book? Because we haven't, and we haven't seen the movie. I read the book, but it's eight years old. And I don't... <laughs> I've had, <laughs> I've had two kids since then. And Chris has had 7,000 uh, years. years uh, so I don't remember. So I have no idea. No idea what... Uh, uh, is, <laughs> what is the so it, it could be good. Don't know. Don't know. Not sure. We'll figure it out. Maybe Number nine. Nine years Eleven old. Eleven years ago. Um, Mr. Johnson wants to go old. But do you guys remember Radical Publishing? Yeah, they were they're all about television optioning stuff. That was yeah. the last book they ever came out with. They came out with a few. I forget some of the others, but yeah. Um, uh, the British Bake Off. <laughs> but originally it was a Radical. John says the... Uh, uh, John answered it. It's the, good. The book Thank was good. So it was not just eight years old. Thank you, John. Eleven John. years old, and it was good. John, do you know how old it is? Old. It's eleven. Jesus Christ! Yeah. Woo. Oh boy. Well, if you're still watching this, uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can go to aroundcomics.com/shop and buy yourself a hat or a T-shirt that may show up sometime in the next eight to twelve weeks. I don't know exactly. <laughs> know that there, there are delays. So I don't, I can't make any promises of of, of how often uh, it's going to, or how soon it's going to show up. But you can, you can help support the show there. Who knows what the world will be like in twelve weeks? <laughs> you, you might need a shirt. We, that should be. Yeah, a I, you definitely of, might need a shirt. Look into the future. Um, do, do you think like everyone's going to be wearing leather? Do you think uh, like bullets will be like you know bandoliers are going to be yeah. in place? I'm hoping. I mean, uh, you've been collecting bandoliers for decades. You've been traveling the wastelands of America, finding terrible comic book shops. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing left standing is like just the one, one bad comic. One of the Mad Max characters that's bald and like covered in like white body paint. Yeah. Digging through a dollar box. Yeah. Hey man, I'm ready. I'm armed. I, uh, I you know, I've been training for, <laughs> for this, for years. Uh, you know, I'm ready to go. Let's. Uh, I want to get this over with before I get too old to be functional and. Uh, I want to do a lot of things. Are what there any? Are there any? Um, do we have any um, around comics masks that people can wear? Yeah. No. I. I. I did not. Uh, I. I did not. Is that a Sorry, you're not Is that murder hornet? <laughs> <laughs> Chris has got a murder hornet. In his Chris house. was murdered in during the recording of the show. Um, I you no, know, we could have, but I I don't know. I felt weird about it, honestly. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't, and and also because there's delays, I'm like, well, I don't even know when anybody's gonna get it. Okay, so Twelve I mean, weeks. Who the fuck knows? What? Yeah, you may not even need it. Yeah. I mean, the country's opening up, right? <laughs> Open this bad boy up. Let's get going. <laughs> Who needs a mask? Who needs a mask? Yeah. Wear, wear a mask. Wear a mask. Yeah, please. <laughs> wear a mask. Please. I'm joking. Yes, wear a mask. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I, I was I was laughing. There was a um 
I was watching another like comic book podcast thing and it was a live stream and, and a guy was streaming from his store. He was a comic shop owner and he's wearing a mask and they're like giving him a hard time. He's like, well, there's people in the store, guys. I got it. Like, I'm running. A <laughs> and it's like, good for you, dude. Like, I'm glad you're, you know, yeah. don't, don't uh... take off your mask for the interview. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like people are giving him a hard time. It's like, no, he's doing the right thing. Leave yeah, him alone. Yeah. It's just a comic book podcast. No one gives a shit. Who cares who's got a mask on? Was he? Who fucking cares? Right? Yeah, was, was, was some big news? Yeah, everyone's doing comic book podcasts. You see Paul Shear from uh, the League. You ever watch the League? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He does a comic book podcast. Now. Does he? He's a big nerd, right? We already did it. We did all the comic. We did all the topics. Yeah, <laughs> covered. Paul, sorry. I'm gonna start a. I'm gonna start a comic book podcast where all we do is talk about Diamond. <laughs> oh god! Every every week, and the only topic this... is the direct market. It's <laughs> we never talk about any actual books, like never like anything other than just. Can we put like, through previews page after page. <laughs> we just like endlessly discuss the same thing. Over and over well, that was one of my comments when I was on when I was on with Joe. I'm like, is like there ah. any other industry in the world? <laughs> we just talk about <laughs> distribution constantly. Yeah. Like nobody else does this. Like, who cares? It's the worst. How does my bread get to the store? I don't know. <laughs> Talk to me. Why, am, why am I always talking about how the comics get there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> distribution chains. It's like, oh my god! Yeah. So my podcast. Did you hear about Doritos? Did you Did you hear Tom about Doritos? Yeah. <laughs> the distribution troubles. They're switching. Frito Lay is switching. The first episode of my new uh, podcast, Indirect Market, will be. Uh, it's it's a daily podcast, twenty minutes <laughs> about the direct market. <laughs> It is called indirect. Yeah, indirect market. And everyone, <laughs> and we literally say the same thing. It's literally people just like <laughs> repeating the same thing that we've heard for like 30 years. I mean, it's obviously important to the people that sell comics. It's their livelihood. I'm just always like, oh, my God, are we talking about distribution? Are we talking about distribution again? We're talking about the catalog again. Well, I mean, to be fair, we've been talking about the same thing for 25 years. I know. And finally, something actually changed. <laughs> something did it. It's the biggest week. We in, missed it. We in, missed yeah. The only missed. time, you know. <laughs> there was actually news. There's actually <laughs> something. Otherwise, it's literally been talking about the same thing. Same exact thing. You're, yeah, it's already over. The, the biggest story in a, in, in a quarter of a century in, in comic book distribution, and we missed it. <laughs> yeah, we missed it. It happened. Well, there you go. Well, what are we going to talk about this? Oh, coffin bound. Oh, um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, uh Sal. One of these days. <laughs> yeah. We got. We're gonna. Well, it'll be after our uh, direct market segment. <laughs> We the catalog. The catalog. We're going to do a stinger for indirect market. Have you seen the catalog? <laughs> it's like if you didn't know anything about comics, it would just be like, what are these insane people talking about? Like, we look through this thick book to order the comics like months ahead of time. <laughs> and you look through it. And you're like, All right. It's like, what is this? It's I think there are there are actual YouTube shows of that happening right yeah, now. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's like it's crazy. It's a, it's like a, I, if I ever explained it to my wife, I'm sure she'd be like, "What? What? You have to like, yeah, you gotta look through this. They send they send you a catalog. You look through it." She would immediately make you stop. Yeah, like, well, well, you, know, you know the only other people I know of that hey. exist that look through a catalog before they go out and spend absurd amounts of money on stuff? So, gun collectors. Gun, it's, gun it's, it's, it's comic book fans and gun collectors are the only people that do this stuff. Yeah, maybe hunters in general. Bow hunters probably too. Love a catalog. Love, Love a good catalog. Love <laughs> the catalog. Thicker the better. I still get sent. I ordered like 
one part from this company. Uh, I can't think of the name of it. It's like, and it's a bit, they, they manufacture like millions of parts and they have this catalog that is this thick. No, oh, Granger? Yeah, yeah, I think it's Granger. And I ordered something from them one time mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And every quarter they send me a new catalog. <laughs> send him the catalog. He gets the catalog. Well, the Granger catalog is amazing because it has everything. Everything. It has every, throw part, it away. every part you would need for anything ever. I throw it away immediately. It's like yeah. I come home, it's on my porch. I did that with Uline, but that's just because I hate that family. So I signed up for multiple Uline accounts. So they'll spend the money to send me catalogs and I just use them to start fires. That's kind of malicious. <laughs> Send me all your catalog. It's not passive aggressive in any way. I, I I'm gonna I, I'm gonna pay to get the catalog to look through to pay to buy the comics. You gotta pay for the catalog. You gotta pay for the catalog to pay for the comics. <laughs> that... Hey, but we get into it every day on indirect market. That's what we talk about. <laughs> What do you think? What do you think of for a logo? What do you if you're loving, if you love catalog talk, you love talking about bad comic book stores and good stores. Do you like? Do you like just like talking about how many issues of a comic sold? Indirect market series. You go to place. About comics written eleven years ago <laughs> that you haven't read. <laughs> <laughs> Come here. Indirect markets got the market. market. Yeah. All right, guys. I think uh, is that it. Is that everything we got for tonight? Is that the? Uh, do we have anything else, Chris? Do you have anything else to? Uh, I, found, I found a ton of stuff in my basement. Well, go ahead, man. I got nothing to do. I'm. Right, you know, I, got, I got one more. Um, find uh, find it and read it um, before uh, the Netflix. Before uh, comics are done. Before comics are done. Uh, the old guard. Oh, your old buddy Greg Rucka. It's Greg Rucka, and uh, uh, it's a surprise. Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> what I found in the I found in my basement. I found Greg Rucka himself tied up. <laughs> <laughs> I found Greg. In I found Greg. <laughs> Oh, what are the, this is crazy. What are the odds? <laughs> oh, oh. It's an old blanket. It's, oh, it's, it's crazy. Uh, Greg Rekka and Leandro. Le, Leandro? Is it Leandro? I don't want to say Leonardo. It's Leandro. I believe. <laughs> Leandro Fernandez. Uh, they were a team on uh, Queen and Country, which is another book that I'm very fond of for longtime listeners of the show. Uh, but the old guard, uh, really interesting story. Uh, Charlie's Theron is going to be playing the lead in the uh, the uh, made for Netflix version of the old guard, which I think comes out next week or the mid, mid June or so. But it's uh, it's a story about a, a band of immortal uh, warriors throughout history turned mercenaries and they kind of take on like hopeless jobs and, uh, and kind of like fade into the, you know, into the night, the night as, uh, as they, uh, cause they're trying to protect their identities and, and that kind of stuff. They take over like a bad comic book shop. Yes, yes, they're all, they're all owners of bad comic book shops and then they're mercenaries. They just fade away. Yep. My uh, job here is done. Yes. And it's so, so check out the old guard. The old guard. There's uh two there's a there's another volume of that, right? Like there's another volume. I got the yeah, there's a single issue. Is it here? No. Eh, eh, somewhere. But yeah, there's a second second volume. I don't know if it's done yet. I picked up a couple of the single issues. And uh, checking those out, but oh, uh, what I found it's a vial of blood of Greg Ruckus. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Well, I'm working on a cloning project <laughs> alongside the uh, um, you know, I had started the uh, the horticultural uh, growing, you know, growing weed, 
I, w- I was growing stuff from seed this year, you know, so I've got the the grow room downstairs. And I was like, you know what? I've got the I've got the blood, so why not start a, a cloning project? It can't be that different, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Greg, I don't know. Grow Greg in a pod. Pod people. Uh, okay. You know my uh, wife does not watch that movie. Half feet tall now, um, but it's. I don't know if the the pure hydroponics are enough nutrients right now, so I have to. I have to solve that problem. Make me another queen and country. <laughs> Odd, Greg. He's two and a half feet tall, but his dick is three feet long. <laughs> Write me more story. Write me more queen and country now. <laughs> Or you, or you don't get any. In years, they teased me. <laughs> they teased me with a with a new queen and country. I've Bring got me two. more. One day. Wow. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for a fun evening. <laughs> oh, that was uh, it. Was interesting stuff. You can order yeah. your own mini Greg Rucka to make your own personal <laughs> queen and country from. The diamond cattle. <laughs> You're working on them right here. This is the basic. Is that that's the indirect market, Greg Rucka, right? Yeah, indirect, indirect market. Yeah, indirect market. Rucker. He's he does come with three. <laughs> I I gotta show you guys this, and it's it's hilarious. So I ordered this as a drawing reference thing, and I got it off. Yeah, sure. I don't think it's necessarily made for that, but it's really highly posable and super hyper realistic. Sure. What I didn't realize is is it came with. A dick. Not one, <laughs> but three <laughs> different penises. <laughs> really? Yeah. Detachable penises. Are those detachable with, penises? Yeah. <laughs> with pubes. Look. <laughs> so, um, that's the one. Then there's, then there's this one, in case that wasn't impressive enough Man. for you. Well, and that. then... Get that out of my face. I call this the, uh, the Patriot, because he's at full mast. <laughs> I don't know. No, keep it covered up with your nameplate. I don't want to see it. I'm... <laughs> As you sit down in the basement, hunched over your drafting board, <laughs> if only I, if only I could find an image of a man with an erect penis to, to like, draw. Okay, where this can I weird. find it? Where can I find? <laughs> this is a little weird, and he has no head. My tiny statue. Well, apparently, he has got a lot of head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me see this giant. Well, that was good. I liked it. <laughs> Get one of those little mini, one of those little mini boner statues. It is a posable figure, though. I mean, it, it's really you know quite yeah. quite posable. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Two, oh, only two sets of hands, but three penises. <laughs> gotta have a. You know, you don't know what the what you're gonna need. Who wasn't enough? <laughs> I guess not. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I, those those dudes that draw that need to draw nudes, apparently, you know, need different <laughs> angles of it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they want to capture uh, different emotions. This isn't yeah. the right one. Get the other one. Switch it up. This is wrong. All right. Well, Sal, how do people uh, uh, reach the show? Uh, <laughs> we just got a comment from our friend Chris Marshall. Thanks, Chris. Can't Good wait. Lord. What a time to tune in. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I agree, Chris. Uh, yeah. You can uh, you can contact us at info at around comics. Right there, it's uh, there's our email right there. You know, you can uh, get us at uh, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Tik. No, not on TikTok. Uh, Periscope. Find us, find us on Friendster. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook.com slash Around Comics Podcast. Uh, Twitter at Around Comics. All those, all those good places. Awesome. And uh, and don't forget that you can. Uh, you can get your official Around Comics merchandise at aroundcomics.com slash shop. Yep. Hats and shirts and coffee mugs and good stuff there. So this was the uh, the last of our first round of Comics 101. Uh, if you have a subject out there that you would like to know more about, that you want Sal to uh, to research and... Uh, Whoa, and, and what? 
can uh, teach us about, go ahead and uh, and send your ideas for uh, Comics 101. Wait, you're next. Am I next? No, Tom King is next. Well, Tom King's next, and then you're next. And, and then I'm next. Okay, so I got, I got to think of mine. So, all right. So uh, I'll 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 come up with something. I would. Uh, yeah, we got to get Tom. Who knows when that'll be? He's a busy man. So he is a busy man. But uh, I was thinking Harley Quinn. <laughs> uh, yeah, that'd be a good one. I mean, people love Harley Quinn. She's very yeah. popular for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's you know, who knows where Harley Quinn came from? I mean, I know, but oh, I, hey, I was going to ask you. Mm -hmm. um, see, thinking of psychotic women, um, <laughs> have you watched uh, Killing Eve? Yeah, it's awesome. Oh my god, it's so good. I had no people have been talking about it. And I haven't had a chance to watch it. Yeah, and I was just I was watching it tonight, and I was like, I don't think I've ever seen a woman, a female actor, play that good of a psycho. You know what I mean? Like she is Hannibal Lecter level psycho. Yeah, in that in that show, she's she's so good. Yeah, that that, that show's great. Oh, that was it. I just want I didn't I thought you had recommended it to me. Yeah, same uh, same writer is uh, and actress is uh, Fleabag. Oh, okay. Phoebe, what's uh, Tom? It's Phoebe uh, Waller Cates or something like that. Um, she writes uh, uh, Killing Eve. Fle Fleabag's awesome. Well, no wonder I like it. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. That's yep. why it's so funny. Okay, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, what did I just uh, finish up that was uh, that was pretty honest? Uh, Tom, have you watched? You know, this is not for Sal. Uh, have you finished uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency? No. It's probably weird and quirky enough for you to really love it. It would be too weird and too quirky for Sal. He would. He. I I watched like one and a half episodes of it, and yes, it is. It's too bright for you. Not for me. But you love The Crown, which freaks me out. Uh, the Crown is excellent. It's incredibly well acted and written. And it's interesting about historical information. Yeah, the it's, crown is terrific. But so British. Dirk Gently is dumb. It's not dumb. It's <laughs> well, maybe I, I don't know. I I I, uh, I, I Quir it's quirky. It's too quirky for you. I like American comedy. <laughs> well, Amer Americans laughing and having a good time. The British humor. No, British historical yeah. royal. Are you a Douglas Adams fan, Sal? I mean, I've read I, I read his stuff when I was younger, but I yeah. I was never that big a fan. I, it's same kind of stupid shit. It's too too quirky. Yeah, that's a good way of saying stupid shit. See, see where we are. <laughs> nice way of saying it. No, yeah, no, yeah. It's just I mean, it's it's um, I I haven't not read his stuff in forever. Yeah, I and I do remember enjoying it when I was younger, uh, but. I couldn't. I couldn't give you the basic storyline to to his books anymore. Um, but yeah, it's definitely uh, it's it's. I can't think of the right word. It's it's. I mean, quirky is a good good one, but there's there's another word that I can't quite come up with. But it's yeah, it's a little too um, just out of sync. You know what I mean? For me, but it's quirky. I know people that love it <clears throat> for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, uh, Sal and I will never agree on this, and that's a good way to end this episode. Uh, yeah, we'll be back uh, next week. Uh, send in your uh, questions, comments, suggestions to the show. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and in the meantime, in between time, we'll be everywhere in and around a terrible comic book shop. Ooh. Indirect market. Indirect market. Um.
Comics.